Welcome everyone to the April general meeting of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. And I wanna open up by saying what a difference a month makes. Last month, we had that freak one day winter storm where we had to basically cancel the indoor or the live meeting and just meet on Zoom, which went very well as it usually does. And then the following day, all the snow was pretty much gone, at least on the streets anyway. So uh, that really kind of, that kind of really sucked. <laughs> just terrible timing. And now a month later, it's like nearly 90 degrees out there. Uh, on Monday, we're supposed to get at least flakes of snow. Uh, but today it's warm, and uh, so I think that's uh, affected attendance a little bit. But between here and Zoom, we're probably pushing, I don't know, 50, 60 people. So uh, thank, every, thank everyone for joining us, both uh, here live at the Kalamazoo Area Math and Science Center and also uh, live on Zoom. I hope everyone didn't have a difficult time looking for a parking space. I had no idea there was something going on in Chenery. This is the first time we've had anything with Chenery since before the pandemic. So uh, we're not really used to checking what they're doing out there, but at least it's not so bad. You have to park like four blocks away. Yeah. So hopefully everyone found a decent parking spot. Hopefully um, people should be able to get in if they arrive late, because I think the doors are going to be open the whole time this time. So it should go very well. Uh, before we begin with our presentation, can people hear me? Let me check there because it's supposed to show our speaker. Yeah, I'm hearing you on Zoom. Okay, great. So hopefully people at home can hear me because yes. it's supposed to show the uh, speaker, but it doesn't seem to be doing that. But, uh, oh well, less people see me, the better, I guess, right? They get to see me during the second half of the meeting. <laughs> so uh, let me start with a uh, president's report. And I'm going to... Uh, switch this. So this is why we need someone to run this. Okay, so just so let me highlight myself here. Yeah, sure. Just don't reformat my hard drive. You know, you IT guys, you can't trust any of them. All right, so, so at least people at home can see me. I know you folks can see me. I, I wish I could hide myself behind a black screen like most of you did during Zoom meetings for the past three years. But um, let me just give a quick uh, report here. Uh, first, uh, I checked the forecast today. Uh, last I checked, there's a, a window of about three or four hours of clear skies tomorrow night, which is good news because tomorrow, April 15th, which is usually tax day, but not, not this year. Um, let me spit my gum out. We have the first public observing session of the year. So uh, obviously you can come out, look through a telescope. We'll have uh, mainly Venus and we'll have uh, some spring galaxies if conditions are good enough. Galaxies are difficult, especially at the Nature Center with you know light pollution. And if there's haze and thin clouds, that makes it even worse. But we will be out at the Candles of Nature Center tomorrow. If skies are clear uh, with the gates opening at eight o'clock. We do have uh, public observing session brochures on the table now, and you can grab one of those on the way out. But if you don't like the hard copy stuff, just make sure you check our website. But either way, you wanna check the website before you head out to make sure uh, we didn't cancel. Because we will post the uh, go or no go notice on the website no later than 6 p.m. If it's obviously gonna be clear, I try to post it as soon as I can so people can plan to come out and not make other plans. If it's obviously going to be cloudy, I tend to cancel it fairly early. But tomorrow, it looks like it might be one of those wishy-washy days where it could go either way. So I might wait as late as I can, which is 6 o'clock. That's when I try to post it um, on the website, uh, no later than 6 p.m. So tomorrow, it might be one of those days where I post it at like the last second just to make sure uh, if it says skies are going to be clear but at 3 p.m., but by 6 p.m., it, cl it, it clouds up and... Trust me, that has happened many times before uh, where we thought it was going to be clear and, um, or cloudy and it turned out to be the exact opposite of what the forecast said three hours before uh, the six o'clock deadline. So you can never tell. And uh, not only do we want just visitors to come out and look through telescopes, but we need people 
with telescopes. That's the most important thing. Um, if we just have two or three this time for the first session, it shouldn't be too bad. Attendance isn't usually terribly heavy during the first session. But let me tell you, oftentimes the first session is the best one of the year. Um, it's a, we're kind of late in April now. We're, you know, we're roughly mid-April. But usually when we have them like a week before, you know, it's still relatively dry, not humid yet. It might be a little cold, but man, is it nice and clear and transparent uh, quite often for the first session of the year. And it is, again, kind of late in April, but the first session in April is often the only one where we get to see the Orion Nebula during a public observing session. By the time we get to late April, it'll be gone. Uh, it'll be too low to observe. And uh, so, of course, we'll have the observatory open with the 16-inch uh, uh, Ashby telescope with uh, Nona riding on top. Uh, we have the new 8-inch Dab out there that uh, if Mumbauer doesn't uh, show up to operate, um, somebody else can. We have the new Telrad and Telrad charts for it, which we still have to get put on. But we have, uh, you know, we have at least two telescopes out there already. But uh, if you can bring your own, that would be great. Uh, there are some volunteer positions available. Uh, the first one you probably saw in the newsletter, assuming you read the newsletter, <laughs> and that is of equipment manager. Arya uh, contacted me. It's probably been about a month ago. And uh, he said he might be traveling a lot for work and so on and so forth. So he wouldn't be able to handle the uh, duties of the equipment manager. And it's not a demanding position, maybe the worst part of the job, uh, especially if you have someone that doesn't want the stuff taking up room in the house, is you might have to, you know, store a couple of telescopes. Usually the uh, Coronado PST, you know, our solar telescope, that's in constant circulation. Um, Mike Cook has had custody of the uh, short tube 80 so long that I guess Arya forgot about it and he reported that it was stolen. And it turns out Mike Cook had it the whole time. Uh, so we still have the short tube 80, which Mike Cook still has. And um, uh, the, the big one is the Celeste R8. It doesn't take up a lot of room, but you know um, that's the one that might spend the winters in your house or something like that. And uh, then we have the big binoculars, you know, they're in a big, long, narrow case. Uh, but we do need someone to uh, act as a new equipment manager. Uh, Arya said he would do it for probably a couple more months, and then we'll, we'll, we'll definitely have to start uh, kind of pushing people uh, to volunteer. I know, I know Jeremiah kind of expressed some interest, but, you know, he already does publicity for the club, and I'm trying not to let Jeremiah or anybody else fall into the trap that I did. Uh, where I'm kind of trapped now, where you just we do way too much and you get maybe burnt out. So I'm, I, I'd like to spread these things out. It's, you know, good for the health of the club. Uh, the other job is current, technically occupied, but uh, to uh, maybe not put it so nicely, I, I think we'll have to fire the person that's doing it now just because of his hectic schedule. Um, I, I still hope he participates, but it's clear uh, that Mike Cook uh, can no longer handle the library telescope program. Um, I got contacted by the Portage District Library a couple days ago, and he's had a telescope of theirs uh, for repair for a long time, like months and months, and they don't know what's it's, what the status is. And I've emailed him, and you know sometimes it's hard to get him to reply because again he works a crazy schedule for the evil Coca-Cola Foundation. You know they're a pure evil corporate empire. And uh, so, you know, it's not his fault. And uh, so we just need someone else to head up the library telescope program. Uh, there's only two telescopes at the Portage District Library. Again, Mike Cook has one. The other is currently in circulation. And the Kalamazoo Public Library has the other one. Uh, the, the Portage Library had three at one time, but one just sort of walked away and never came back. <laughs> uh, so they're down to two. But, you know, um, the New Hampshire Club started this program maybe a decade, 15 years ago or so. And for them and many other clubs, it spread like wildfire, you know, throughout their part of the state or, you know, for New Hampshire, the whole state because it's so small. Uh, but um, we haven't had too much luck with ours yet because we don't have someone to push it. But if you don't want to take it upon yourself to spread it everywhere, uh, you can maybe just, you know, uh, just maintain what we have. Uh, maybe once a year, maybe twice a year, uh, you'll just have to, you know, clean up or repair the telescopes. It's really easy. Um, you know, you don't really have to do that much at all. 
So, so we need a equipment manager and a, a, a new library telescope coordinator. And maybe if Mike Cook's schedule improves, he can work with you. Because at one point, Mike Cook did have two other volunteers uh, that worked with him on a regular basis on that, but they are now both out of the club um, and no longer able to help them. You know, things, uh, things change. So we desperately need uh, an equipment manager, and it would be good to have a new library uh, telescope coordinator, someone that can email or answer emails in a timely fashion and so forth and, and stuff like that. Um, oh, I was going to bring it up on the screen here, but uh, we won't worry about it now. Is I, And I can show this after the uh, presentation as well, but uh, starting in November, uh, from November to March, we're going to have our Eclipse series. I'm trying to think of a spiffier name for it, but I can't think of anything else. If something comes to mind, let me know. But uh, starting in November through March, we're going to have a series of uh, general meeting presentations, uh, astrophotography uh, talks slash workshops, and just straight up workshops toward the uh, 2024 eclipse on April 8th. And I'll uh, show you the entire schedule later. Uh, none of it is confirmed because right now I'm in the midst of writing the grant, which I haven't done since Astronomy Day 2017. But it, it doesn't have to be very long, and I just need to actually do it. But I've been kind of taking a break lately. But but we have uh, some great speakers um, for both general meetings, uh, SIG meetings, and so forth. And so instead of you know doing everything at once on Astronomy Day like we did in 2017, we're going to spread it out over several months to make maybe uh, things a lot better. Plus, we learned uh, during the pandemic how to advertise you know outside our area. Uh, I, I built up a database of uh, libraries, uh, astronomy clubs in the U.S. and Canada, even Britain, um, and we plan on contacting other clubs and stuff like that to have the success we had with, with, with the uh, Introduction to Amateur Astronomy Lecture Series, where we had, you know, basically 500 people attending lectures and stuff like that. So if we can do that for the Eclipse Series, uh, that would be awesome. And I guarantee, I guarantee, especially for some of the astrophoto talks that we have coming up, because uh, Alan Dyer is going to do a two-parter on that, and uh, those should be heavily attended. We, we might even have to go to a Zoom version for a thousand people in a webinar or something like that. Uh, I'm guessing that'll bring in a lot of people. And we're going to do a great deal of outreach. I've already spoke with uh, 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 the Air Zoo. Uh, I, I met with them. I think it was this past mo or Monday, or maybe it was last Monday. Time just vanishes you know and uh, of course they wanted us there on april 8th 2024 and i just basically laughed and said no <laughs> uh fat chance of that um um but uh we're gonna do stuff th with them uh solar oriented maybe in june uh we might do some stuff with them during the partial eclipse for us on october 14th and then we might do some other things there with them as well. And then we're going to do some stuff uh, definitely at the uh, uh, Parchment Library. You know, I saw oh, there, there's Karen. And uh, so, so, so we're going to do some stuff there because they have lots of stuff going on as well. Have you started collecting Pringles cans yet? Uh, not yet, but another brand that I'm so Right. I mean, All right. <laughs> so if you eat Pringles, save your cans and give them to Karen. They make great pinhole viewers. You don't have to put a box on your head anymore. Just use a Pringle can. It's much better. They're, they're airline friendly too. Who wants to take a box to go over your head on an airline trip? They'll, they'll think you're crazy. And of course, uh, I want to mention, as you already saw, we have our Eclipse poster out there. And if you find San Antonio, Texas, we're going to be hopefully just west of there. I know several members have signed up. There are a bunch of stiffs and deadbeats like Sinclair there. Who's not going? See? And if, it, and if it gets clouded out, I'm going to rub it in for all of time. All right. So um, I'll come back to the Eclipse stuff later because I forgot to bring that open because, as usual, we had technical issues. Uh, make sure I use the original USB cable that came with the camcorder and not the other one because... It don't work, as I discovered. But uh, we have a great speaker tonight who is joining us uh, via Zoom. And so tonight's guest speaker's interest in astronomy dates to learning a bit about the constellations as a Boy Scout. 
which I know many people have in common here. And he also enjoyed using small telescopes, especially the one his parents gave him when he was in junior high school, when there was such a thing. He earned a bachelor's degree in physics at the University of Minnesota, and then went to grad school at the University of California, Santa Cruz, which of course is the headquarters of Lick Observatory. And he received a PhD there in 1974, having spent close to 100 nights photographing planetary nebulae, star clusters, and other targets with the great 36 inch refractor. And apparently it was too small. So he immediately joined the University of Chicago, uh, uh, the University of Chicago faculty at Yerkes Observatory. So he went from a 36 inch to a 40 inch, although I'm sure the 36 inch was a little bit better because of the conditions that they have out West. And he became director of Yerkes in 2001 and served as, uh, as director through the time of the transition for Yerkes from over a century of being primarily a research facility to becoming a uh, education and outreach facility. And uh, we need to take another field trip there to kind of support the new uh, education and outreach efforts there. After officially retiring in 2012, he continued some research and uh, considerable, considerable involvement in education and outreach activities until Yerkes was closed by the University of Chicago in 2018. He continued uh, involvement with glass education programs run by the former Yerkes education staff, largely away from Yerkes, uh, largely away from the Yerkes site. And he is also somewhat involved with the new administration at Yerkes. And so without further ado, please welcome Dr. Kyle Cudworth, which we'll, we'll get him up here soon. Go ahead, switch over to him there if you want. Spotlight him or something. Okay, you're seeing my head, but. I need to share my screen. We are seeing your screen now. You are seeing it? Yes, we are. Okay, then I guess we're ready to get started. So there you should see a picture of your Keys Observatory. We are. Okay, then I think we're all set. But since I'm mostly going to talk about star clusters, we'll get away from the picture of Yerkes to a star cluster picture. And I entitled this Tales of Star Clusters because I'm going to be talking about various things I've done and just give you an idea of the things that have been in my research for close to 50 years or over 50 years. And one of these clusters has tails that we'll get to. I couldn't resist putting in the pun. Well, as most of you probably are very well aware, we tend to separate star clusters into two groups, the open clusters and the globular clusters. And open clusters, if you're amateur astronomers at all, you probably know the the nearby ones in particular, like Pleiades and Hyades and Coma and Pricipe, and those distances are typically a few hundred light years for those brightest ones. And the general characteristics fit the name open. They're not strongly concentrated in general, and there can be anywhere from a few dozen to a few thousand stars in the clusters. The age range for these clusters can be enormous. There are young ones that are still forming, like the, a few million years, less than 10 million years for the cluster associated with the Orion Nebula, to some things that are extremely old, eight or nine billion years or giga years. In other words, up to about twice the age of the sun. Most open clusters, however, are toward the young end of that range, less than one giga year. The main issue here being that the gravitational pull of the rest of the galaxy tends to pull the cluster apart. It doesn't 
because it's not terribly massive, not terribly strongly centrally concentrated, it doesn't have enough self-gravity to hold itself together. And the cluster seems to just sort of dissolve into the disk of the galaxy. Chemical composition of the stars in open clusters tends to be fairly similar to that of the sun. And of course, like everyone, we talk about the sun as having normal chemical composition. What we know best is always what we call normal, whether it really is normal or not. In this case, it applies to many, many of the stars in the solar neighborhood. And so normal is a reasonable name for it. When we talk about chemical composition in astronomy, we're talking about how much does the star have of heavy elements, of things heavier than helium. The hydrogen and helium dominate the makeup of the star, but what varies from star to star is the stuff heavier than that. And that can be things like simply carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen that are quite common, but very often, what we're measuring will be the iron abundance simply because the measurements have to come from spectroscopy and iron has lots of lines in the optical part of the spectrum and so it's easy to or relatively easy to get iron composition. Nowadays it's a lot easier to get a whole lot of elements not just iron. The other characteristic of open clusters is that they are almost all in the disk of the Milky Way. Not very many are up out of the disk. Now, you think about these close by ones, like some like Coma and Pricipe are well out of what we think of as the band of the Milky Way, but they're also so near us that they're not that far out of the disk actually, even though they don't appear in the band of the Milky Way. And of course, the familiar pair that are now starting to run off into the sunset of the Hyades and the Pricipes, Pricipe, excuse me, Hyades and Pleiades. And if you've been watching them this past week, you know that there was an intruder running through that neighborhood. Uh, Venus has been near the Pleiades through the past several nights. I think Monday or Tuesday was probably when it was closest to the cluster. But if we go on then to contrast with the globulars, instead of the nearest being a few hundred light years away, the nearest are several thousand light years away. And the best we can do with the naked eye tends to be see them as faint fuzzy blobs. With telescopes, of course, they look like a whole lot more, but fuzzy blobs to the eye. And M13 is the classic northern one as an example of this. And to those who go into the Southern Hemisphere, 47 Tucani and Omega Centauri are naked eye objects in the Southern Hemisphere. Most of what you tend to think of as globulars, the classical globulars, the Messier globulars, contain hundreds of thousands or even millions of stars. So it's a very different regime in terms of number of stars for most of what we think of firsthand, at least, as globulars. The classical globulars are quite centrally concentrated, but even among the well-known ones, there's a lot of variation in how strongly concentrated they are. And I'll show you a couple of pictures in a little bit, examples of that. The big difference against the open clusters is that while open clusters have a great range in age, the ages are all very old for globulars. They have some of the oldest stars in the Milky Way. The chemical compositions are what we tend to refer to as metal poor. Metal being a strange term in astronomy, referring to things that are, a chemist would not call metals like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, but anything heavier than helium is a heavy metal, or at least a metal in astronomy. And these, the compositions tend to be low in these heavy elements by a factor of four compared to the sun down to factor 200 compared to the sun. And I think most commonly about a factor of 40 down from solar. And while some of these are in the disk of the Milky Way, 
many of them are well out of the disk of the Milky Way, and many of them concentrate off in the general direction of the center of the galaxy, direction of Sagittarius. How do we make the distinction? Well, if you go look it up in books or whatever, you will find that the distinction is the appearance. I think I can convince you with a few pictures that that's, that can be misleading. In practice, that's not how astronomers tend to make the distinction nowadays. In the 1950s, as people started understanding how stars evolve, they were able to get ages for star clusters and found that all of the classical globulars, the M3, M5, M13, M15, those sorts of clusters that those of you who use even moderate sized telescopes have probably looked at many times, they're all extremely old. And so the working definition by the mid 60s was basically an age issue. If it's extremely old, call it a globular. If it's not, it's an open cluster. Well, because there also is the difference in appearance, there has been the saying that at least in our Milky Way galaxy, they don't make them like they used to. The old ones are really massive clusters, is what we were thinking of at least, and quite concentrated. But of course we have to confuse matters because when you start talking about compact clusters in other galaxies, they're sometimes called globulars even when they're young. And I tend to prefer the term young massive cluster rather than young globular cluster. I'm not sure that's catching on with as many as it should. Well, let's go to some pretty pictures. This is open cluster M36, uh, done using the Skynet uh, telescope network, but this used the Yerkes 41 inch reflector. And this was imaging through three filters assembled into a color picture by an eighth grade student several years ago. Uh, the first time we'd had a, an eighth grader into our high school program. And following that, it was extended down to include middle schoolers, not just high schoolers. But she was looking for something to do. And I suggested that, well, you could try making some color pictures with the imaging from the 41 inch. And she did. And we'll see several of those. So when I indicate something as a, a color picture from the Yerkes 41 inch or from Skynet, it's work done by this eighth grade student several years ago. But some other open clusters, this was the astronomy picture of the day a little over a year ago, and I decided I'd better save that one because it would fit nicely in this talk. Example of three open clusters, and you can see some distinction there. The one in the lower left is a little more concentrated than the others, but these are all open clusters. Another open cluster, one of my favorites to look at the Yerkes 40 inch and to show other people is M11. Wonderful open cluster in the summer sky. The reason I like it with the 40 inch is that it is nice and bright, but also nice and compact, which is a problem. Most open clusters, when you start looking at them with a large telescope like the 40 inch, spread well beyond the field of view of the eyepiece, and this one doesn't. This one at least shows the main part of the cluster within a, a view of the eyepiece in, on the 40 inch. This is a scan from a plate, the fourth recorded plate taken with the 40 inch back in 1900. But a modern color picture with the Canada France Hawaii telescope same cluster, slightly different orientation, however, but same cluster, M11. Now we go to globulars. Here's M10 as just kind of a generic globular. But here are a couple of others, M13 on the left and M92 on the right. They are similar distance from us. They're in about the same part of the sky. These are both images taken with the 40 inch refractor in 1901. 
and the areas shown are five arc minutes square. So the difference in central concentration is pretty obvious, even though they are both globulars, and that's not a difference of distance. It's physically the clusters are differently concentrated. Well, here's another one that you might be hard pressed to say, is that an open cluster or a globular cluster? Especially since it is in the disk of the Milky Way. M71 is a globular by age. And so this is a, a bit of an exception in that it's not anywhere near as rich and strongly centrally concentrated as some of these globulars. It's also metal rich as globulars go, meaning it's only about a factor of five metal poor compared to the sun rather than factors of 10 or 40 or 100. But then we can also find globulars out at very large distances. This is NGC 2419, roughly 300,000 light years from us in the very distant outer halo of the Milky Way. This is an image from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey showing things down be well beyond 20th magnitude. But also at similar distance, another globular, I mean, 2419, nobody's gonna argue that is that it isn't a globular. It really looks like a globular is supposed to look. But in the center of this is Palomar 3. Pal 3, similar distance to 2419. It is a globular, but it sure doesn't look like much. It's an extremely sparse cluster in the far outer halo of the Milky Way. And another PAL-5, Palomar-5, it's only moderately distance. It's only about a quarter as far away as these last two that I showed you, but it's also pretty sparse. And we're gonna return to PAL-5 later. This again is a Sloan Sky Survey image. So now if we were doing this in person, I might ask for a show of hands, but at any rate, we've got two clusters here that happen to lie close to one another in the sky. The one with the bright blue stars is M35. Many of you may know that. Uh, it's an old friend of mine. My first research project as a grad student involved doing membership study of M35. And at that time I noticed this other faint cluster down in the corner of my plates, which is NGC 2158. And one might be tempted to say, we have an example here where we've got both an open cluster and a globular cluster. And if you were look, to look up information about NGC 2158 from 1950 or before, you might find people saying it is a globular. However, by age, it is not. It is an open cluster. It is a couple of billion years old, not the 10 billion that a globular would need to be. So I decided 50 years ago or so that I someday would get back to doing something about NGC 2158 because while I could do something with M35 as a first year grad student, I was not able to do much about 2158 at that point. Well, Another shot of M35. This was just my digital SLR attached to a mid eight inch to go a little bit deeper, not as deep as this uh, CFHT picture, but typical of what you might see through a, a moderate sized telescope if you look at M35. And M35 can be seen with the naked eye under good dark skies and while I had observed it with the Lick 36 inch, I had not realized at the time that I took a, a couple of plates of it with the 36 inch that it was visible to the naked eye. Partly because I was chasing it off to the west and the western sky from Lick has rather bad light pollution even 50 years ago from San Jose. And so I, maybe it wasn't visible to the naked eye when I observed it there. I first noticed it visible to the naked eye, believe it or not, at Palomar, that I was 
couple of years later in 73, I was taking plates of that area with the 48 inch Schmidt telescope and glanced up along the side of the guide scope and realized, oh, I'm seeing M35. Uh, since then, I've seen it with the naked eye many times, including from Yerkes uh, a couple of nights ago. NGC 2158, again, a, a Skynet picture. And you can see the brightest stars in the concentrated area there are yellow, which is typical of an old cluster, but it's not a globular. Well, why are star clusters important to astronomers for doing the research? Or why are they research topics of considerable importance? Well, some sources that you look at will tell you that all stars initially form in clusters. I'm not convinced of that because I think I can show you some examples or tell you about some examples of stars forming now that are not in clusters. But nevertheless, it's probably true that most stars form initially in star clusters. They are the best laboratory, best place to test our calculations of stellar evolution by comparing the theoretical calculations with the observational data. Those comparisons also allow one to determine the ages of the clusters. Again, that's a comparison between observations and the theoretical calculations. But if you want to study how things have evolved in our galaxy, you need to put ages on things. And so star clusters are extremely So we've got the clusters visible at very large distances, useful for mapping the Milky Way. And historically, though less so now, cluster distances help provide luminosity calibrations for many high luminosity stars and therefore calibrated the distance scale of the universe. And of course, there's also the factor that I've been accused of using to help select what I did research on. They're beautiful to look at, whether you're using binoculars to look at the Hyades or the Pleiades or small telescopes to look at something like M35, Nurki's 40 inch refractor, or the Palomar 200 inch. And I did have the privilege of observing the 200 inch back in the 1990s. And we had a partly cloudy night that things were coming and going. And I sat in the prime focus cage watching M13 come and go. And that was kind of fun, although I really would have rather had it stay clear so I could get the data I wanted. In general, in studying star clusters, we assume that all the stars within a particular cluster formed at the same time from the same well-mixed cloud, dense cloud of gas and dust. And if that's true, then all stars within a particular cluster should be essentially the same age. Now, in a very young cluster where you've still got stars forming, you might come up with a cluster age of say, three million years, and there are stars that are going to be half a million years old or something like that. But by the time you get to an age of say, 20 million years, an age different star to star of a couple million doesn't matter. And certainly when you get to 100 million or a billion years, the very slight difference in age star to star is pretty much negligible. The other conclusion that you would draw from this is that all stars with a particular cluster should start with the same chemical composition and should still have the same heavy elements until you get to looking at what's deep inside the star. What's on the surface of the star, which of course is what we can see, should be pretty much what the star formed with. And all of that seems to be pretty much true for open clusters. There are a few exceptions that people have pointed to, and it may be that most of those are exceptions because of close binary stars that have dumped material from one star to the other that really messes up what you conclude of ages for them and what you conclude of chemical composition. For globular clusters, there are many clusters and maybe most, maybe all, where there are chemical composition variations from star to star. 
And sometimes people have identified multiple generations of star formation, different populations within the cluster that seem to have age differences. So globulars are not quite so simple. Open clusters, much more so. We used to think globulars were simple. I'm pretty much convinced they're not as simple as I thought they were 40 years ago. I'm going to go quickly over this of how we get der distances derived. We plot typically color, which in this case is the difference in magnitude as measured through a blue filter and through a so-called visual filter, which is the yellow-green part of the spectrum. So that's the color on the horizontal axis of these graphs. The vertical axis is a magnitude. And in this case, these are the visual or the green-yellow magnitudes. On the left, it's an absolute magnitude, which is how bright the star would be if it were at a distance of 10 parsecs or 32.6 light years. That is derived that most stars fall along that sequence that's shown there. We call the main sequence. Something like 90% of the stars in the solar neighborhood would fall along that. When we start looking at star clusters, on the right we see Pricepe, where we have plotted, instead of absolute magnitude, we've plotted the actual apparent observed magnitude and the B minus V color index. And we see some differences, but we still see the, a diagonal sequence. We see a main sequence. The difference between the apparent magnitude and the absolute magnitude, well, if we look at something about 0 0.6 in B minus V, which is roughly the sun, we'd find about 4.7 as the absolute magnitude. But if we come over here, same color in Pricepe, we'd find about 10.7. Pricepe is far enough away from us that its stars appear about six magnitudes fainter than they would if they were 10 parsecs from us. So that difference between the observed magnitude and the absolute magnitude is a way of measuring the distance. The other thing to point out about this is that what we found is that looking at main sequence stars, this is an increase in mass as we go up to the more luminous stars. These stars up here are probably a few tens of solar masses, a few 20, 30 times the mass of the sun at the top there. And we get down here to things that are less massive than the sun. Well, massive stars evolve more rapidly than low mass stars. They are so luminous that they're using up their energy quickly. And once they have exhausted their fuel source in their core, something's got to change. And what happens is that they will leave the main sequence. So that's what we see here is a main sequence turnoff in Pricepe that could be used to get an age for the cluster. Here's an example of a globular cluster color magnitude diagram. And I'm gonna show you quite a few more globular diagrams, but this is well-known M5, reasonably nearby as globulars go. A lot of what I show you will get down to around 16th magnitude because that's what could be done with old photographs. This was something, uh, sort of state of the art of what could be done in color magnitude diagram of a globular as of when I started working on these sorts of things in the 1970s. And in a stellar evolution class, I might point out that we can identify where the, what the sources of energy are at various stages along here. I'm not gonna take the time to go through that, but this is the main sequence and that's hydrogen being converted into helium. We've got red giants, we've got horizontal branch stars. Well, let's go on and talk about what did I actually do in my research. For decades, I have been deriving or using proper motions for stars within clusters, mostly globulars, but some open clusters. And proper motions are very small angular motions of stars across the sky that we derive by comparing the positions of the stars on the old and new photographic plates. 
or nowadays it would not be done with photographic plates. The new ones would be CCD images probably. But the displacements that we're looking at tend to be at the level of hundredths of an arc second per century. So we're talking about really small displacements between the old and the new plates. Originally, my purpose for doing this was to weed out the non-members. We go back to this M5, if it would stay there. Uh, we've got a bunch of stars over here that, some over here that, some in here, that our normal stellar evolution calculations would not explain those. And so the suspicion might be that those may be non-members and we'd like to weed them out if we're trying to compare the observed color magnitude diagram with theory. Or are some of these members, and we have to figure out why are there these peculiar stars that are members? So what I was trying to do was do membership via proper motion. The basic idea is that the cluster members should all move pretty much together, and non-members would have rather random motions different from the cluster members. It turned out that we were able to get precision that was good enough to also study the internal velocity of stars within a cluster. If you think about it, every star in the cluster is feeling the gravitational pull of all the other stars, and it's moving in response to that. It ended up being a rather interesting statistical problem to figure out how everything should be moving in there, but the point is that every star is moving within the cluster and we have high enough precision that we're able to derive that in quite a few clusters. And then we've also been able to look at how the clusters move in their orbits around the Milky Way. Well, to do this, you've got to find old images. And that meant finding old plates. And I have sometimes talked about this as astronomical archaeology digging around in the old plate files to see what I could find that might be interesting, might be useful. When I started back in the 1970s, the standard lore was that the old and new plates had to be from the same telescope or possibly from very similar telescopes. Uh, the only example of doing it with very similar telescopes that I'm aware of in the early 70s was Yerkes 40 inch and Lick 36 inch. Pretty similar. Generally, it was said you had to use refractors, you had to use plates all taken in, through the same color filter. In other words, if you're working in the visual part of the spectrum, you've got to use V plates for everything. You can't mix in the blue plates with it. By the early 80s, I realized that we had enough computing power that we might be able to violate these traditions. And so I tried some cases where I was mixing plates taken with different telescopes and taken through different colored filters and found that it worked extremely well. Could mix plates from reflectors and refractors all in the same solution and get good proper motions out of this. And that made a big difference because then I could prioritize what are the clusters that are astrophysically important and then look for plates for those rather than just working on the clusters that happen to have old plates in the Yerkes files or in the Lick files. But it was a matter of the computing power that became possible in the, the 1980s and of course ever better since then. And what we were doing in the 80s and 90s typically we could use anywhere from 15 to 40 plates in a solution spread over anywhere from 30 years, 100 years, often mixing things from reflectors and refractors in different colors and so forth. But everything has changed in the last few years. The European Space Agency satellite Gaia, it's currently obtaining fundamental data data for over a billion stars. And this includes positions, proper motions, parallaxes for fundamental distances and photometry, and now um, low resolution spectroscopy for a lot of these stars. 
down to around 20th magnitude. The final data are going to be fantastic precision, whether it's a few years till that comes out. The parallaxes are already doing a great deal to improve the fundamental calibrations of stellar luminosities. But this completely changes the kind of research I was doing. It used to be that the majority of my time was spent measuring the plates and doing the reductions going from the raw measurements to the actual proper motions. I still work with proper motions. And what I do once I've got the proper motions is the same as what I've always done. But now I don't have to derive the proper motions. A few minutes on the computer and I can download proper motions for stars down to 20th magnitude in any piece of the sky that I choose. So I can take everything within 15 arc minutes of the center of one of these clusters and in a few minutes I can have it all downloaded from the Gaia data. The painful work that I would used to spend months on has been done by the large team that supports Gaia. Now, we don't have the final data yet, but the first very preliminary data release, and it was really preliminary, DR1 in September 2016, my former grad student Rick Reese and I used that to put together a paper for the 2017 January American Astronomical Society meeting. And we had the first trigonometric parallax ever of a globular cluster. About 10 times further away than the previous thing that one could get a, a good trig parallax of. It wasn't an especially good one. It wasn't good enough to distinguish some questions that might be of scientific interest, but it was a, a demonstration of what was to come because it, with that extremely preliminary data, we were able to get that. And we jumped on the opportunity Rick had done study of M4 as his first project as a grad student back in 1988. And so we jumped on this, wanted to get in there first with the first parallax. Two years later, we gave a paper at American Astronomical Society meeting with data release two from Gaia, showed that the data release two proper motions were better for globular cluster membership. Not only did they go fainter, but they were higher precision than what we had been able to do with a century of plates doing things photographically. And lots of other people did lots of stuff with the DR2 proper motions. DR3, there was an early data release of data DR3 that had proper motions and parallaxes came out in late 2020. The full release came out last June, and that's even better than DR2. And I've done a little cluster work with it, but I haven't been doing very much these this past couple of years. And it's going to be very interesting to see how much better this can get with the final data. However, while the Gaia data is fantastic, the rest of what I'm going to talk about here is what we did photographically, or almost entirely will be that. And a lot of it used the Yerkes 40-inch refractor. For those of you who have never been over to visit Yerkes, there's what it looks like, and that is your speaker standing by it, taken a few years ago when I was not quite as gray as I am now. But at any rate, that's the telescope. You'll have to if you come over now, you'll have to pay a lot more for a tour than you used to have to when we were doing it as part of the University of Chicago. The new administration charges a lot more for the tours. But as I've moved to fainter clusters in the 1990s, I had to go to bigger telescopes. And 200 inch was the telescope of choice for some of this. And standard picture, the 200 inch I think this is one I took, but it might have been, might be one of their file photos that anybody could find. This was definitely taken by either my former student or my then current student in the early 90s, uh, showing me in the prime focus cage and what it looked like. And no, we didn't waste telescope time uh, shooting that picture. 
that was probably taken in 92 where we had four nights and the first three and a half were cloudy and mostly snowing. So we took lots of pictures, but not through the telescope. Well, if we're comparing old and new photos, can't go much older with Yerkes 40 inch than plate number one on the left here, taken in 1900, May of 1900, five hour exposure under not the very best conditions. On the right was, I think a 20 minute exposure, maybe 30 minute taken in 1988 under really fantastic conditions. So there's a difference in seeing, difference in sharpness of the images and a difference in length of the exposure, but that's a comparison of old and new plates. But you've got to measure the positions of hundreds of stars on each plate to a precision of about a, a micron, a thousandth of a millimeter, which at the scale of the 40 inch comes to something like a hundredth of an arc second. But once you've got the proper motions, there are sometimes easy cases and sometimes a little less easy cases for getting the membership. These are graphs of the proper motions. On the horizontal axis is the proper motions in the X coordinate, which is basically right ascension. The vertical axis is the proper motion in Y, basically declination. And on the left, you've got M4. And what we see is a whole lot of stars, hundreds of them concentrate at essentially zero proper motion. That's because we defined the zero to fit this large group. That's not an absolute zero proper motion. It's simply relative because we use the motion of the majority of the stars to define zero. And then we've got a scattering of stuff that's not part of that clump. That clump is several hundred stars that are cluster members almost entirely. The scattering are the foreground, mostly foreground field stars, non-members. NGC 2158 is a little more complicated. There is a concentration in there, but it's a lot harder to dig out the membership because the proper motion of the cluster is not very different from the proper motion of stars in the foreground and background but you still can derive something useful about membership. And since most of you have probably never seen a, a photographic plate, there's plate one from the 40 inch sitting on a light box at Yerkes. And I put a ruler on there to give you the scale of things. Remember these of course are negatives. So that's the original negative plate off the, the 40 inch taken in 1900. And this is an example of a student, that's me on the right, and a student from the University of Wisconsin-Madison leaning over the light box using a magnifier to look at the images on a plate. He was working on an open cluster and he was, had worked with the proper motion data that a friend of mine had used Yerkes plates to drive proper motions for the stars in this particular cluster. And he was working with what that friend of mine had done. And so when a group of students came down from Madison and I was showing them around, I dug out one of the plates that had produced the proper motions that he'd been working with. And first time he'd had a chance to look at a plate. And was so he was looking at the raw data, very raw data of things he'd been working with. This was taken, a, a couple of years ago when we still wore masks a lot. As you can see, I don't have a mask on because I was doing a lot of talking and I wanted them to be able to understand what I was saying. Well, M4, we looked at example of that as an easy cluster to drive the, the membership for. This is M4. Some of you may know it as a fairly easy cluster to find in the summer sky because it's about one degree west of Antares. Antares, if you have any idea of constellations, it's a bright star in Scorpius. Easy to find, pretty far south from our latitude, but it's easy, still a nice bright first magnitude star. And about a degree west is M4. 
but it's a really, really messy field. All of this mess is light reflected by dust in the foreground. This may be light emitted by hot gas heated by this star. But there's an awful lot of dust there. And in fact, if you look at this, it looks like there might be fewer stars off on this side of M4 than on this side. And in fact, what we found was that there seems to be more dust on the right side, as in this picture, the west side, than on the east side. So there's a difference in the absorption by the dust and in the reddening by the dust from one side of the cluster to the other. Complicates matters a little bit. But here's an example of what we could do with membership. On the left is the color magnitude diagram showing red giants and horizontal branch stars of everything we measured, several hundred stars in the field of M4. And on the right is what we got once we applied the membership criteria. And cleans up the color magnitude diagram enormously. This is one of the easiest examples. It does an excellent job when the cluster motion is extremely different from the most of the field stars. Those are stars that with greater than 90% probability of being members of the cluster. Most of them have actually 99% probability of being cluster members. I fiddled my code a little bit or it would say a lot of these had 100% probability of membership, but I intentionally rounded down even the 99.8s, 99.9s to 99, because I never wanted to say absolutely, this has 100% probability of being a member. But at any rate, good clean color magnitude diagram, but it was limited by the old, old plates that we had available, which were mostly from telescopes that Harvard had in the Southern Hemisphere in the early part of the 20th century. First at Arequipa, Peru, and then they later moved them to South Africa. But they were willing to let us borrow them to measure them and then return them eventually. Some of the new plates were taken for me at Las Campanas in Chile by friends down there. Some were taken with the Yerkes 40 inch. M4 is at a declination of minus 26. It's the furthest south thing I have observed with the Yerkes 40 inch, and it's a bit of a pain uh, trying to reach something that far south from this latitude. And I think you're at about the same latitude as we are. But here we go to M71. I first did M71 in the early 80s. It was the first one where I mixed things from different telescopes and in different colors and so forth, only down to about 16th magnitude at that point and cleaned things up considerably. And above 16th magnitude, this is basically the same as what I did back in the early 80s. Fainter than that, in the 90s, I got hold of some plates from the 200 inch and I think I borrowed some old 100 inch plates as well, as I recall, and could push it down to the main sequence. And this, I think, is the first and maybe the only globular where photographic proper motions covered the whole range from somewhat down the main sequence up to the tip of the giant branch. But now it's easy to have Gaia data to do all of that. Well, let's go to 6397. This is far southern cluster. No way we're going to do it from North America. But again, borrowing old Harvard plates, because it's one of the nearer clusters to us, uh, it seemed like it was worth trying to do. And so the borrowed the old Harvard plates, borrowed and got friends at Las Campanas, and maybe, I can't remember for sure on this one, for some clusters, I had a friend at Cerro Tololo who took some plates for me, but I think this was probably Las Campanas because that's what I did, had the most of. And again, it turned out to be like M4. Easy to get membership, the strong concentration in proper motion space of the, the cluster members and the field stars, very different motions from the cluster members. So again, 
example of everything we measured down to about 16th magnitude and then cleaned up with the high probability members on the right. But 6397 turned out to be interesting in other ways. It's at fairly low galactic latitude. It's not very far out of the disk of the Milky Way, but we found that its motion is away from the disk. So you can extrapolate it back. It went plunging through the disk of the Milky Way fairly rapidly a few million years ago. And it occurred to us and us means me and Rick Reese uh, in this case. Uh, Rick was, has been my main collaborator since he finished his thesis 25 or so years ago. Uh, so he went looking at what might we find that's interesting near where this cluster went through the disk. And here's a bit of the, the geometry, uh, an oblique view of artist's conception of the Milky Way showing the path of the cluster plunging through the disk and the sun's location not too much further out from center than where the cluster is at the moment. We take the view of this looking straight down on it and then enlarge that area. We've got sun's position, we've got looking through the disk where the globular 6397 is now, the red rectangle is the best we can do about put, pinning down where it went through the disk. Nearby, however, is this young open cluster, which formed, not just happened to be, but formed somewhere in this green rectangle at the same time or immediately after 6397 went plunging through. So our thought was that somehow or other this globular plunging through the disk of the galaxy triggered the formation of stars that we now, the, from a cloud, and we now see those stars as this open cluster NGC 6231. After we had done this uh, exploration and geometry exercise and so forth, we found that somebody had a few years earlier calculated that it would be possible for a globular plunging through the disk to trigger the formation of stars for an open cluster. And when we contacted the person who had done this theoretical calculation, he was delighted to hear that Somebody had actually found something that might well fit what he had calculated. Uh, we would love to say, ah, we saw his paper and went to test it, but no, it went the other way around. We had done the test and then we found his paper. But at any rate, it's quite possible that the globular plunging through the disk triggered formation of this open cluster. Let's go to another example. Palomar 5, I showed you a color picture of this from the Sloan survey back early on in this talk. This is the scan off of a Kitt Peak four meter plate. And yes, you can convince yourself that there are a whole lot more faint stars in the, this region of the, the plate, but it's really not a very impressive thing. However, the color magnitude diagram that people have done pushing it faint enough to see the main sequence turn off shows that indeed it is a globular cluster. It's really sparse, but it is a globular. And here's how the membership cleaned up. We could only push things down to about 21st magnitude with the plates we had available, but cleaned up the membership considerably. And here we found something that we saw some of in some other clusters, what people have seen in a, a lot of older open clusters and in globulars, had been claimed to not have any in, in this cluster, but yeah, there clearly are. These are called blue stragglers. They are st stars that were main sequence stars where they're very close binaries and one of the stars 
has dumped material over onto the other, which changes the masses of the stars and makes them look like more massive stars. They're called blue because they're toward the blue part of the color magnitude diagram, stragglers because they're above the turnoff from the main sequence. They're not evolving as rapidly as they should by normal stellar evolution theory, but it's almost certainly because they're binaries. The other thing about PAL-5 was you recall that it's extremely sparse and it had been assumed that this thing is so sparse it must currently be about as close into the center of the Milky Way as it ever gets. The thinking was that something this sparse if it came, came closer in would get torn apart as it came near, near the center of the galaxy or passed through the disk of the galaxy. And so the guess was that it was currently at the inner part of its orbit around the Milky Way. And so we were expecting that, but we were able to get the full orbit of it. Others had gotten the radial velocity and we had the proper motion of it and calculated the orbit. And we found that, no, its velocity indicates that it's actually now near the outer end of its orbit. It's going to come much, much closer in than where it is right now. That much that it was going to come much closer was obvious within a few minutes of when we got the, uh, the velocity de derived. What it was, then we went to talk to our friendly neighborhood dynamicist to calculate the orbit and he found it was going to come through about midway between us and the center of the galaxy. And he concluded that there was a good chance that on its next passage through, it would be totally pulled apart. And his comment to me was, I'd love to know what that thing looked like before the last time it went through the disk of the galaxy. But surely a lot of stars got pulled out the last time. And so I started looking into whether there was anything I could do with the plates I had to look for these stars that we expect could have been pulled out. There had been lots of calculations over the last few decades of what happens when they when stars get pulled out of a globular cluster, they should array forward and backward along the orbit of the cluster. You should see these tails ahead and behind the, the cluster along its orbit. People had looked for these things and not convincingly found them. However, this was in the mid 90s that I was working on this and we had a grad student who had spent a lot of time helping to build the camera for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And to do her PhD thesis, she had to do some science, preferably with this camera that she had built. And she and I were talking about it and concluded that, or realized that the test data, the first strip of test data that the Sloan camera had taken included PAL-5. Now the Sloan survey derived magnitudes and colors for the stars. And so she could look for stars that would fit the PAL-5 color magnitude diagram, but were not necessarily right at PAL-5. And her PhD thesis had this contour diagram. The strong concentration, the high point in the contours here is the cluster and stars that have that fit the color magnitude diagram array out in tails that fit with the proper motion that we found for the cluster. So they are arrayed along the orbit of the cluster. As the Sloan survey progressed, we, we now know that these tails extend much further out, but just in the test, Sloan test data showed this. This had long been suspected, long been expected. PAL-5 was the turned out to be the perfect test case. And Connie had a, a fantastic result for her thesis. Uh, Connie has gone on to now being a faculty member at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She served for about a year as interim director of the University of California Observatories. 
but uh, got out of that last summer when a new regular director was appointed. So she's gone on to do well in her career. This was her PhD thesis completed in 2001. I remember very well her th final oral thesis defense got delayed a few days because nobody wanted to travel in the days after 9-11. So I didn't want to go from Yerkes into Chicago for her thesis defense and so every, her defense got delayed a week. Well, let's go to an open cluster, NGC 6791. It looks as populous as some of the globulars. It's one of the oldest, probably around eight giga years. It is metal rich relative to the sun. It shouldn't be by normal expectation. If it's that old, it should be somewhat metal poor, but it isn't, it's metal rich. It's a puzzlement as one finds in said for certain things in a certain musical that some of you might know. At any rate, there have even been some claims that there are two generations of star formation within this open cluster. I'm not sure people believe that claim, but uh, let's not go through this. Just example of how I mixed plates from Lick 120 inch to Lick 36 inch, Kit Peak 4 meter, Yerkes 40 inch, and again, Kit Peak 4 meter. But here's how things cleaned up when we got our photographic proper motions and derived membership from those. We've since done a little bit better with Gaia data because there were other people who wanted the very best membership in this. So I did a, a Gaia derivation of membership for my friends at University of Wisconsin. Well, I think we can probably finish off with NGC 2158 the one that sits right next to M35 that I looked at back in 1970 and said, someday I want to get back to doing something on that to improve the membership. And I've tried various times. The best I could do photographically was this as of the late 90s. And this is proper motion diagram, or rather the, the color magnitude diagram of everything that I measured. And these are the, the full filled circles are the things with greater than 90% or greater than 80% membership probability, open circles greater than 50%. It's still something of a mess. So last year I played with the Gaia early DR3 data and it's a little bit better, but I don't know what to make of all of these things over here. They shouldn't be there by any reasonable explanation of things. And I want to dig into it a little bit more and see whether I may have stumbled upon a case where the cluster was just too dense and the Gaia data cannot be trusted in the dense core of the cluster. I'm, I hope it's that. If not, then we've got a lot of work to do to try to figure out what's going on with, with these stars. But again, I have not really had the time this past year to, to dig into that the way I would like to. Well, time to dry, draw this to a close with a few conclusions that in some of these clusters, some of the stars that had peculiar characteristics are cluster members, but some are not. Some are not cluster members, their foreground field stars ignore them in the study of the cluster. Rick Reese's PhD thesis confirmed that the basic distance scale for globulars as of the 1990s was very close to correct. It's been improved upon now with the Gaia data, of course. But there were a few clusters that we looked at that had incorrect distances as of the mid 90s that we improved upon apparently the existing distances that people had had gotten messed up because they had not done the, the correction for foreground dust correctly m71 
this globular cluster that's a little bit on the sparse side and in the disk of the Milky Way. Its velocity turns out to keep it in the disk. It is a disk cluster. It has a velocity that would be perfectly reasonable for an open cluster, but it is a globular. And this had been suggested by Bill Morgan at Yerkes back in the 1950s, and almost no one believed him. It was a fun afternoon when I got the velocity derived and walked down the hallway to show him the derivation. <clears throat> he had retired uh, the day before I arrived at Yerkes in 74, but he was still coming into the office for most of the day, most days in the early 80s when I derived this. And it was kind of nice to confirm what he had suggested. NGC 6397 may have triggered the formation of an open cluster as it went, as it plunged through the disk. PAL-5 is sparse because it's being pulled apart by the gravity of the Milky Way disk. And the stars being pulled out were found by Connie in her PhD thesis. 6791 was a puzzle when I started working on it in the 80s. Uh, there's still a lot of interesting stuff there. 2158 is a little less confusing, but it's over 50 years since I first thought it needed work and I'm still not happy with what we've got on it. So there's still more I want to do. Retirement is not completely retirement, although I'm not doing all that much astronomy these days. So close with a few thoughts. I didn't think I was going to spend my whole career working on old clusters, but there kept being new interesting things to do, and so I kept working on them. And I certainly didn't expect doing anything as traditional as photographic proper motions would get me into the prime focus cage of the 200 inch, but it did. And it was an experience, quite an experience to have, what, five observing runs spread over four years in the early 90s with the 200 inch. Uh, and now Gaia just changes everything. Uh, we can do so much more, and I'm not taking the time to do very much of it, leaving a lot of that to some younger people. So leave it at that. I'm perfectly happy to answer some questions. I'm as long as I'm sharing my screen, I don't see the chat. And so somebody will have, if there are questions in the chat, well, either I'm going to have to unshare my screen or somebody will have to read questions from, aha, from the chat. Aha. Now I can look at chat. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Cudworth. That was really interesting. Okay. I see one question in the chat. So I'll take that first because I think that okay. was posted pretty early on. Uh, isn't the movement or speed directions of stars in the cluster dependent on their locations in the cluster? Yes. The stars closer to center usually are moving faster than stars further out in the cluster. And we were, we were able to look at, do stars just kind of circulate around at random or do they move from uh, out near the edge into the center and then back out toward the edge and so forth? And it's different in different clusters. Uh oh. <laughs> well, we might have to cut Q&A short. Looks like he froze up again. It's there in person wants to oh, ask. No, he's back. All right. Do we have any questions here in person? This time you'll definitely have to use the microphone so he can hear you. There you go, Anna. Thank you. So you've talked about globular clusters moving through space and losing stars. Do they ever pick up stars? and take them along with them? It's vaguely possible, but in general, no. The people who have done the dynamical calculations have said that, no, they're moving along fast enough that they're not really gonna pick something up. Who's next? Yeah. Now, um... I apologize in advance, like any court jester, but um, 
two things that was from the king and I, right? A great yes. puzzlement. And that I just was not, I was leaving that as a um, question for the audience. <laughs> All right. Well, I, 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 I bit the bait, right? Um, there's a sucker born every minute. But my question is, are uh, globular clusters indigenous to this galaxy? I know I may be stepping on some toes and being outrageous, but I've heard some nasty talk that they are not. Please address. Okay. The answer is maybe, uh, but we can be much more specific than that. It looks, the most recent conclusions seem to be that we have quite a few globulars that formed as part of the initial formation of the Milky Way, but we have a lot of them um, that have been accreted by the Milky Way, that they were not originally part of the Milky Way. They're, they were part of small galaxies that have been accreted, have come close to the Milky Way, been pulled in, and the stars of those dwarf galaxies in some cases can be found as streams kind of like the tails of pal 5 uh, around the milky way in other cases the the stars that were just part of that dwarf galaxy are so scattered through the the halo of the milky way that we can't pick out necessarily which ones belong to which dwarf galaxy initially but the globular clusters would have held together and so we have quite a few globulars that were almost certainly not part of the Milky Way originally and have been accreted at various times over the, the 12.8 billion years history of the galaxy. So the answer is yes, both. Some formed initially as part of the Milky Way. Some have been accreted along with dwarf galaxies along the way. Okay, a couple more questions have shown up in the Zoom. Why are globular clusters found around the central disks of galaxies? Well, I think it's basically that you've got a lot of mass in the center of a galaxy, and so everything concentrates around the center. In the case of the Milky Way, those clusters that concentrate around Sagittarius and not necessarily down within uh, a few hundred light years of the center necessarily, but many, several thousand light years out from the center. They concentrate around there simply because everything concentrates around there. And those are the ones most likely to have been part of the Milky Way originally. Some of the ones that are further out probably were part of the Milky Way originally, but the further out you go, the more likely they are ones that are created. And then as a beginner, uh, someone who's asking, what form is your results? Long text files, spreadsheets, special database? Uh, what more than these plots? Okay, the data, the, the papers that I published are all in the open literature and generally contain the tables of the data. Uh, nowadays, there would be long tables posted. In, in quite a few of my cases, the, the long tables have been posted by me or by one of my collaborators. But yes, the tables are uh, the, the final form. The, the plots are a nice way to look at things, nice way to show things, but the, the data tend to be posted online, but also, as we know from lots of areas of science, um, there are, until there's a refereed paper, it should not be considered the, the definite word on it. And so some, there are a lot of things that have been posted available online, but have, are not in uh, refereed papers. Is there anything that uh, amateurs could do for science with open clusters or any kind of cluster with, um, you know, modest sized telescopes and CCDs or CMOS? 
I think there's probably the first thing that comes to mind is variable star research. And the American Association of Variable Star Observers, I think, probably has recommendations as to what could be usefully done on star clusters. The point being that professional astronomers in general can't do all the monitoring that might be useful to do. Now, some of that's going to change with the, the Rubin telescope when it comes online in a few years, because it's going to get everything reachable from its site, uh, maybe image twice a week. So there'll be a whole lot less uh, that escapes the professionals at that point, but there still will be things that if they're varying on time scales of hours or minutes, Ruben's not going to find them. You've got to have a dedicated monitoring of a particular cluster to find these things. And there's been lots of study of variable stars in globular clusters. In fact, part of the reason that there were these old Harvard plates going back to around 1900 is that the uh, superintendent of Harvard's Southern Station, uh, Solon Bailey, was very interested in searching for what we now call our Lyrae stars, they then were called cluster variables in globular clusters. And so when I first inquired of Harvard to, as to whether there were plates on the globular M22, it's the first one I was trying to find old plates of that I asked about, Har about it at Harvard. And the response, of course, this was back in 1979 or so, not an email, it was a letter. And the response came back, we have about 100 plates of M22. You probably better come and look at them and select which ones you want to use. Oh, and by the rule, way, we have a rule that you cannot take plates away from the Harvard plate files. But we also make exceptions when it's necessary. Now, it turned out the person in charge of the plate files at that point was interested in variables and globulars. So she was quite willing to loan them for what I was going to do of telling her which of the stars she was looking at were members. Um, but because there's been this long history of looking at variables in globular clusters, the things with periods of several hours to days or weeks are pretty much known unless the amplitudes are really small. If they are varying plus or minus a tenth of a magnitude, they might or might not have been found yet. But with modern CCD photometry, that's not a pain to do. You can look for those. And we did, I had a, a grad student who did a little bit of that kind of thing photographically in the 1980s because we could do photometry on the photographic plates a whole lot better by then than had been possible a decade or two earlier. And so he found a number of lower amplitude variables that people had not found before in the half dozen clusters that he did. The stars whose variability he was trying to get more data on turned out to be non-variable. Uh, they'd been claimed in, the, in published literature to be variable stars. And so we started this project of trying to figure out details of how they varied and which clusters had them and so forth. And the result was that, no, they didn't actually vary. But he did find a number of variables that had not been found before. But again, that was photographic data. There's been some done on CCD data. The AAVS, the AAVSO would know far better than, than I know off the top of my head exactly what's been done and what needs more work. But I'm quite sure variable star work is a, a place where amateurs could make a useful contribution because of what can be done with with CCD cameras these days. And and I think there's software routinely available for, for doing this. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Cudworth. I think we're gonna have to go ahead and call it there because 
we need to take our uh, snack break and we have our open forum discussion afterward. But uh, I want to again thank you for joining us. We'll give it give everyone a chance to give you a round of applause. Well, I enjoy doing this. I enjoy uh, getting some of this information out to the amateur astronomy community. And uh, I'm glad I happened to run into Eric Schur roughly a year ago and put me in connection with you, in contact with you guys. Yes, I was going to thank Eric Schreuer for uh, bumping into you in the dark at Yerkes Observatory and uh, suggesting you as a speaker because that was that was great. I love me some clusters. <laughs>